computer. So just bear with me while we get ready to record. <laughs> okay. All right. We are ready. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. So my name is Mary Pagano. I'm going to be one of your hosts today. And Mercy Gilbert, uh, who is also uh, the coordinator and the maker and the putter together and made this event happen. So um, I will host the first hour and Mercy will host the second hour. And um, so our focus today is around the female leadership during COVID. And obviously we've had a lot of challenges around the world. So we wanna hear from everybody. We've got um, about 12 speakers today. So we have a very tight agenda. So if, if uh, folks can stay under 10 minutes, that would be brilliant. So we'd like to be able to stop at the, the top of the hour or, or two hours, this is a two hour conference. Um, so let me get started. Um, so I want to introduce um, Honorary Bob, not, I don't know, if, Neil, did I spell it? Did I say your name properly? If not, I ask that you guys reintroduce yourself because I'm terrible at, at pronouncing names. So please accept my apologies to, to begin with. So with that said, let me turn it over to Bob. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come. Mercy is an old uh, friend and colleague of mine, so I was delighted to uh, uh, accept her suggestion to come and say a few at the beginning of, I think it's a very important uh, conference. Um, uh, my role, as you know, is as a member of the UK Parliament, a former minister, and I now chair our uh, Justice Committee in the House of Commons. It'd be nice if we could have uh, given you a shot of the House of Commons in the background, or, 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 or invited you there, but I'm afraid that we can't do that at the moment with the COVID restrictions, but that's one of the many things that we've had to live with, and actually uh, one of the many challenges uh, that we've had to deal with. I'm sure better times will come along as far as that and many things uh, are concerned. Um, but I wanted to, as well as thanking Mercy for um, both the invitation and the work that I know she does, uh, both uh, with uh, Hera, but also um, uh, as a leading community. Um, I also wanted to say how, how timely I think this is uh, as a conference, uh, because COVID has put challenges. Bobby you muted your phone. Bob, can you? There we go. How's that? Okay, perfect. I just, Thank you. I, I just wanted to say that you know, COVID has put challenges, um, unique challenges, uh, in the way of leadership, leaders as individuals, and the leadership structures uh, that uh, countries have around the world. Uh, and uh, women in leadership have, I think, particular, unique, uh, and uh, uh, special experiences that we need in that mix. The challenges of both producing and rolling out vaccine programs, which we're very proud of in the UK, the pressures and understanding and uh, making sure that policy decisions take into account the massive social pressures of, of long lasting lockdowns, uh, the implications uh, for the family, for social structures, for healthcare systems, for the economy, all of that needs the broadest possible input. I think women across the globe have actually stepped up into leadership roles uh, at, at every level. It's not just at the national level, it's uh, within government, of course, and within parliaments, but also we see it in particular with women in local government, uh, where that's been at the forefront. Uh, and in the UK, we've got some fantastic women who have leadership roles in our health service uh, and public health systems, and they are at the very forefront um, in the, the uh, borough where Mer Mercy and I are both talking to you from at the moment, the chief executive of our um, clinical commissioning group that delivers all our primary care is an excellent example of a woman clinician taking on a major leadership role uh, and pulling together multi-agency uh, multi organizations uh, to make uh, that work. Now, obviously, we particularly want to look at how that feeds in to the major public space. Um, uh, ministers in the UK are increasingly more representative. I think the key long-term thing, isn't it, it is that our parliaments and our governments are more representative of, of uh, the society and community as a whole. And it's, that's why if 50% plus of the population 
uh, our female, we ought to be making sure that that's the target we have uh, in our leadership roles too, and doing that on ability. And increasingly now, some of the glass ceilings are, uh, are forced back, uh, that we're beginning to see that. We've more female members of parliament in the UK than ever before. And we've more uh, ministers in our government in the UK uh, than ever before. And Prime Minister Johnson is very much uh, committed to increasing uh, that. Uh, within my own, we have a particularly high number of uh, women councillors and local government leaders. And within my own uh, field of, of legal uh, work, um, I'm pleased to say that we actually uh, have 52% uh, of our magistrates are, are now women. Uh, so that's a, a really important leadership role dealing with um, the some of the most important types of criminal cases. We're more in the higher courts, but we have, as you know, had two prime ministers and a president of the Supreme Court uh, in recent years who are female. So we're, we're doing our bit, but there's more to do. But it has to start from the roots, work its way up. And COVID, I think, has exposed particular challenges uh, where uh, women have had to cope with additional pressures. Sometimes, uh, and I regret to say, have had to, to cope with unfair and unjust online abuse when they step up and take tough and not always um, easy decisions for the greater good. We've seen politicians uh, and other public figures in the UK when they're having to explain the situation of lockdown. Sometimes we all know that women can get an unfair degree of abuse on the internet and so forth and we have to recognize that and pay tribute to those who stand up courageously against that uh, th uh, that, that type of behavior and we just call it out whenever but that to my mind reinforces why your conference is important sharing experiences sharing uh, the good practice sharing the learning that you've got and sharing the mission to make sure uh, that we use the talents of all uh, of our society uh, and uh, women leaders uh, are so critical to that and COVID couldn't be a more critical time uh, at which uh, to be um, setting out those um, those particular skills, those particular experiences. So can I wish you the very best um, uh, with this uh, conference. Um, hopefully I'll be able to do it in, in a, a, a more traditional form for the future. Um, I've got to, to go back and do some more parliamentary business, but I particularly wanted to wish you well on behalf of uh, uh, all of Mercy's colleagues in the, the, the UK and all my fellow parliamentarians uh, in the UK uh, and our government uh, as well. I spoke to our Justice Secretary and he sends his very best wishes on behalf of Her Majesty's Government to you all uh, for, uh, for this conference. So good luck. Have a great uh, two hours. Great. Thank you so much. That was such a great conversation. Um, thank you for joining us. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Marinella Mapuri. She is the CEO of Hera. She is also part um, of, a, a member of the Mapuri Foundation, which is doing some great things for the planet. And she is also the president of WISI for Portugal, India. So Marinella, if you'll unmute. You're, you're still muted. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction. Thank you, Mercy. Uh, uh, congratulations, Bob Neal, for your presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you today because we are talking about phenomenal, phenomenal women. Yes. Aren't we all phenomenal? I think we are. I think we are. So we do phenomenal things every day. So talking about women, I cannot avoid talking about the project of Hera and Hera City. And uh, I think Mercy uh, wanted me to talk, to present this project here today and uh, talk about what we are doing around the world. Mary, she is an advisor for uh, Hera. Mercy, she is an ambassador in the UK for Hera. I see other members of Hera also in the, the group of the speakers like Rosalia, I, I, I think I'm not forgetting anyone, forgive me if I did forget someone. Uh, so Hera is actually present all over the world. Uh, and I'm proud, I'm proud to speak about Hera and Hera City today. Hera started 20 years ago as an informal movement with the purpose to help women in educational and entrepreneurship actions. 
In 2018, I have decided to give a legal body to this informal movement that I have created 20 years ago. And uh, I created an NGO called Terra Association. And I'm going to read just a, a little, little bit of the status of Hera Association that says, Hera acts in the promotion of active women and their global civic intervention in defending peace, the environment, and the more human, social, and sustainable society. The search of human development and the reduction of poverty through good governance through studying and the development of science. Harris supports women in scientific, technological, cultural, educational goals, promoting entrepreneurship and innovation. The action of her association is universal, as universal is the woman in all her different situations. That's why we are phenomenal. And uh, in 2019, I challenged, I challenged a very good friend of mine, is the architect Joe Bachtia. I don't know if he's here today, maybe, I don't know if he's attending the conference today, but Jill is the architect of Harris City. And uh, I challenged him in 2019 to design the perfect city for, for women and humanity. Uh, and so, this is the way it was uh, born, the project of Hera City. We started with roadshows, conferences, forums, to, all over the world, to present this intention in, of building a city and trying to ex explain the importance of such project. Of course, then COVID comes and we are obliged to be stuck at home so no more travels, no more contacts, personal contacts with, uh, with the government, because this is a project that has to be done together with a country. This is a project for a country. This is not a private resort or a private project. This is a project for humanity and especially a project that will enhance the role of the country and will bring development to any place or any country where it is, this city will be built. Because this city will bring together the students, the leaders, tourists for conference to discuss the condition of women and the future of humanity. And it's also a place to live in. So it's actually a city with everything that the city has. Uh, I could explain very deeply about the Hera City, but I don't think you allow me the time. So I'm going to just speak in general because I know that the time is very short. But Hera City will raise as a smart green city. And it is going to be a visit, a visit card of what should be the ideal city for humanity and with the women leading the mission. So this is why it is very important that we women uh, raise our hand, our effort, our uh, uh, and be all together so that we can actually make the change. And this is a physical place. That will be the place where we will all meet, we will all uh, discuss uh, and try to find solutions for humanity, for, uh, for a better position of women in the world. It's a, it's a symbolic, a symbolism but it is necessary to have a physical place. So this, uh, uh, we have several tools of communication. Mary, she's directing Hera TV is one of her communication tools. But I would say that the biggest communication tool of Hera is the Hera perfume. This is very powerful, this perfume. is a non-profit product, a non-profit perfume created by one of the one of what is considered to be one of the best bio uh, perfumers in the world is the French uh, perfumist uh, Jean Charles Sonera from uh, Sevesans House of Perfume in Paris, and uh, he I challenge him to create a perfume that would link all the women in the world through the same scent. Isn't this powerful? to link all women in the world through the same scent and make them responsible to help other women because they know that by buying this perfume, which is a non-profit because 
the royalties of the perfume come to her association and is going to be totally used for projects and institutions of women. So uh, we are going to show to the world, we launched this perfume on the 8th of March, the International Women's Day. Now we are in the process, exactly. Here it is, Jean Chasson-Merard and our magnificent uh, Herod, Herod the Light of Women perfume. Like Jean Chasson-Merard says, it's an universal fragrance of elegance. It doesn't need one. Of today and tomorrow. No, it shouldn't be. perfume. Uh, and in fact, we are going now to choose the, the right distributors so that this perfume is available all over the world, so that every woman can afford to have it, and so that we all use this perfume and make ourselves responsible for other women. And then we will drive all these women to Hero City in a very near future, hopefully, and all these women will recognize themselves through the same scent. Isn't this powerful? Isn't this powerful phenomenal women? So I know, I know I have to finish, but <laughs> am I allowed for how many seconds more? I would like to explain what, one minute only. Okay, in Hero City, we have three pillars that are very important. It's the pillar of convention, that is the convention center where the change will be made and which will also be the monument in honor of women because it has been uh, designed by Jill uh, Bastiat as an iconic monument. So it's going exactly. to be stunning, stunning. Yes. Uh, and then we have the Institute of Advanced Studies that will study the future of humanity. And we are gathering the best minds in the world in our observatory of the future of humanity that already exists in Portugal. And uh, we invite them to come. Well, now we don't invite anyone because they are not allowed to travel. But the purpose is this one, to invite them to come to debate and to publish work about the future of humanity. And last but not least, the museum showing what is the role of the women in the past, in the present, and what we expect for the women in the future. And from this center that is composed by these three big pillars uh, is uh, all a city to serve this center. And uh, well, next time I'll speak more about it, just for Hero City, okay? And thank you very much. I wish that this conference Uh, is going to be growing many phenomena, and that's what Herod is, is for all the women because we think we are all phenomenal, and it's for humanity, and woman is on top of humanity, because when you educate a woman, you educate a family, you educate humanity, and by educating a family and humanity, uh, we hope that in the future, that those people that have been educated by the right women, the right uh, women with the right uh, in, uh, uh, structure that we want to give them will be different and will make a different world and a better future for humanity. Thank you very much and wish you all a very good conference. Thank you. Thank you, Marinella. That was, uh, um, I, I am so excited to be part of HAIR and I know that anybody that's on the team is also very excited about what, what's uh, being created. So thank you, thank you very much for your leadership. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, 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 Her Excellency, Excellency, I can't even talk this morning, see, it's, it's Miami time here, Hilda Suka Mofuzda, Ambassador of the African Union to US. So open your, yeah, and you need to unmute. All right. Yes, yeah, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, I would want just to begin by saying uh, my, to do my salutations to Marinelle Miripuri, founder and CEO of Hera and the Miripuri Foundation and advisors to Mirupuri Foundation. Uh, honorable guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I feel so honored and delighted to address the distinguished gatherings of women 
on women in leadership in the, um, achieving equal opportunity. And the, what a good time for this to come, this uh, uh, meeting uh, in these COVID times in the, with what women are doing out there. And I thank you for inviting me to speak on this uh, forum. Firstly, allow me to commend Hera and my Puri Foundation for the leadership in convening such an important meeting on women in leadership during this International Women's Month. From the African Union side, this meeting is timely because it is held right after the swearing in ceremony of the new leadership of the African Union Commission. As we are talking about women in leadership, I'm pleased to share with you my excitement that at the AU level, and for the very first time, uh, the position of the deputy chairperson is occupied by a woman, Madame Monique Nsanza Banangwa. This constitutes a significant step forward in the right direction. In addition, strategic portfolios such as agriculture, food security, infrastructure, energy in the ICT at the continental level are headed by women. This confirms to you ladies that, ladies and gentlemen, that it can only be a process uh, and not an event. We gradually ink closer to what we want with patience, with, with him making sure we're putting the right tools in place, we will certainly get to where we want. So today we celebrate us as African Union that the deputy chairperson is a woman and those other portfolios are just being held right now by women, which I've already mentioned. That's a plus. Ladies and gentlemen, key integration projects for women empowerment that the EUC will focus on uh, uh, for during the four years to come include the effective implementation of the African Union strategy on gender equality and the women's empowerment, GEWE, 2018 to 2028, which was launched during the AU summit February 2019. GEWE is tra transformational in that its outcomes aim to mitigate, if not eliminate, the major constraints hindering gender equality and women's empowerment. So that women and girls may participate fully in economic activities, political affairs and social endeavors. A number two, the declaration of years, 2020, to 2020 to 2020, 2030, have been branded as the new decade of women's financial and economic inclusion during the 2020 AU summit. In this declaration, African leaders recommitted to scale up actions for the progressive gender inclusion towards sustainable development. We are more at the national, regional, and continental levels. And the third one, the Maputo Protocol scorecard in the index and the AU Gender Online Reporting Platform are examples of continental instruments to support the implementation, monitoring and reporting of the obligations and allow an assessment of the extent to which gender equality and women's rights obligations are implemented. The fourth, the African Women Leaders Network was launched in 2017, jointly by the African Union Commission and the United Nation, Nations with the objective of harnessing the world of African women. African women's experience of leadership with the cause to strengthen their contributions to building and sustaining peace, security, political, economic, and social processes on the continent 
towards the realization of Africa's Agenda 2063 and the SDGs. The network is an unprecedented movement of African women in leadership positions who aim to serve as a vector for increased mobilization of women in diverse sectors. The network will make it possible for women to shape the path to peace and development on the continent. Uh, today's meeting focuses also on COVID-19 and its impact on women's empowerment. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to reverse most of the gains made over the years in promoting women's empowerment in Africa. Diversion of resources to COVID-19 may delay implementation of agenda commitments that are not seen as urgent. Sexual and gender-based uh, uh, violence has increased drastically during the period of lockdown. It has led to a secondary pandemic across Africa. Women's financial inclusion has suffered with the closing of many women's enterprises and cross-border trade. As we all know, most women are into informal trading, uh, which allows for movement. But now all those areas are closed for women. The urgent need for now is the COVID-19 vaccination for Africa. Yeah. The African Union is calling for equity in access to COVID-19 vaccine because we believe that no one is safe until everyone is safe. It's a, it is our, such a our firm belief of the African Union. And at the same time, I would want to say women are very optimistic and uh, very much resilient to such pressures of what is happening at the moment. I foresee women rising and making a difference as soon as these vaccines are within all the, all the areas uh, in the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, despite the bad news brought by the COVID-19 pandemic with the African continental free trade area, one of the EU's flagship projects of the African Union Agenda 2063, which kicked off on January 1st, 2021. It is a new era in Africa, as we speak. The new market is estimated to be a 1.3 billion people across Africa with a combined gross domestic product GDP of 3.4 trillion. These are the times uh, which really look so positive. Exciting times is what we call them in the continent. With a population of 1.27 billion people and with the most youthful population demographic in the world, things are looking Africa. Africa is a place of promise, let me put it that way. Africa is also the second largest continent in the world and it is the most expansive in diverse concentrations of natural resources. There's also tremendous potential for heavy investment in all sectors from small to heavy, to heavy industry manufacturing, technology, agribusiness, tourism, renewable energy, to name it. African continent of free trade area is not just a trade agreement. This is our hope for Africa to be lifted up from poverty. The Secretary General of the African Continental of Free Trade Area Secretariat at the virtual launch event said, had to say this, that this is our time to be lifted out of poverty. It is also expected to boost intra-Africa trade, promote industrialization, create jobs, and improve competitiveness of African industries on the global stage. African Continental of Free Trade Area is meant to empower African women entrepreneurs by improving their access to trade opportunities. According to the African Development Bank, business operated by women are a key source of income for many poorer households. If developed into more productive enterprises, micro enterprises could be a driver of inclusive growth and can enhance the Africa, uh, the intra-Africa trade through value chain. Therefore, Africa continues free trade area should, have, should take into consideration the high 
participation of women in the informal cross-border trade in the value chains and public procurement. However, while progress has been made in this implementation of the EU gender, gender agenda, challenges persist, particularly a slow progress in implementing commitment on women's rights, such as those enshrined in the Maputo Protocol, enables the persistence of practice that hamper the realization of women's rights in their full potential. Just to keep it, to wrap it up, furthermore, financing for gender equality remains inadequate with the budgetary allocations not being commensurate with the cost cutting nature and the demands of the mandate to promote women's empowerment. My hope is that this platform will coordinate with the African Union Commission and the other key stakeholders to close these gaps so that tangible outcomes are achieved for the African women to take the right place in the Africa we want. I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was really great. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk next. And um, as I had mentioned before, my name is Mary Pagano. I'm a board advisor for HERA. I'm also a board advisor for Femme Foundry, which is one of our strategic partners that I'm going to talk about. And I'm also the founder of HERA TV, which is why we, we uh, coordinated with Femme Foundry. So uh, if I can share a deck here real quick and I'll, I'll go through what, what our partner is up to and what we're doing. Hang on a second here. Okay, can you see my screen, the presentation? Yeah, we can. If you want to hit full, hit the green button, take it full frame. The green button, okay. Top left on, yeah. on the panel. Go across. Oh, I don't see it. Over green. to the left. Oh, to the left? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Oh, there yeah, go. thanks. Yeah, okay. there you go. <laughs> oh, good. That green one. <laughs> you would never believe that I've been in tech all my life. <laughs> but anyway, so Fem Foundry is a mobile app. And um, the focus on Femme Foundry is to connect and unite the women around the world. So um, we want uh, women from ages, you know, 16 to 150, however long we live, right? And the mobile app is about connecting us around the world because we've, there's so many really cool female organizations around the world, but not everybody knows about them. And so this, mo this mobile app, think of it like, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, TV, podcasting, and academia. So, um, so there's uh, education, the group directory. Hera is um, in the group directory. It's a great place for us to have private chats and also for other women to find out about Hera and other organizations. So the whole point is that any woman that has a business, we want you there. Any woman that is you know, looking for female empowerment, we want you there. Any woman that's part of a female organization, whether profit or nonprofit, we want you there. So when you think about 51% of the global population is women, um, and yet we're less than 10% at the table, it's really important for us to be able to unite in a healthy way and not be tracked on social media, you know, like, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn. And there's just some areas where you really can't share and, and have some real real good dialogue. So no data selling here. It's it's all about co connecting and uniting women around the world. There's different events on all different kinds of uh, subjects uh, that uh, are important to women. Um, there's the messaging, there's TV, there's podcasts, and there's also a magazine. So um, our goal is as we build out Hera and we, we wanna get the voices from all these women in regards to how they want to live in Hera, what's important to them. So women are great at raising kids, taking care of community, you know, working. I mean, there's so much that we are gifted with our EQ and about um, and about creating a better environment. So I, I think big cities with tall buildings with business names have kind of gotten to a point where we're, we're finding that it's not as healthy as we'd like it to be. So the academia, once again, um, this will be a mobile platform for learning. We know in a lot of countries, women don't have laptops, um, but there are many that do have a, a mobile phone. 
So this will also be their access for intelligence. Um, this is the group, the, the group directory. So any female organization, and there's tons of them. And the point is, is that we want women to know about them so they can join them. Because there's, if you go to Wikipedia, there's like 20 pages of women organizations and nobody knows about them. And this is where we wanna unite the women around the world. And so we can join multiple organizations. Um, uh, our reach is pretty pretty well. We're at 30 million. We're continuing to grow this organization. So if you're a woman, you're in. Um, and, and that's the end. So any questions, just post them in the chat and I can catch up with you later. So from there, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is Princess Keisha Omilana. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So if you can unmute your phone. Can you hear me? Yes, you're all we good. Can. We can, go ahead. Thank you. thank you very much, Mary, for the lovely introduction. And I wanna say thank you to Mercy for putting this amazing forum and panel together. Um, Mercy just has a, a knack for getting the right people at the right time in the same room. So I'm grateful to be a part of this panel with uh, all of you lovely, distinguished individuals. I have to say that I'm extremely happy to hear that Hera launched the perfume on March 8th, which was my birthday. So I will be sure to make sure that I get more information on that because I too want to make sure I'm smelling the right scent. And it's a lovely day, International Women's Day for that uh, perfume to be launched. So uh, glad to hear that March 8th was the day that you guys chose to launch it. And, and um, so I just also want to say how wonderful it is to be able to get together today in the month of March where it's uh, Women's uh, History Month. So a lot of women that I'm looking at on this panel, I'm sure, have made history in their own right. And we are all a part of a collective group of women have been making history for uh, forever. And we think about it, most of us who are here today and in the positions that we are in are because of the women that came before us and made history and paved the way for us to do what we are doing now and doing today. So thank you again, Mercy, for putting it together this month. And um, I'm very appreciative. I am most known as the Pantene Girl. So speaking of history, I made a little bit of history on my own or in my own right as being the first black woman with all natural beautiful hair to major in four consecutive international campaigns and commercials for Pantene, the brand. Prior to my modeling for the, uh, the brand, they'd always had long, gorgeous hair, but it was more weave or more extensions, and it was always blown out. This was the first time that you saw big, beautiful, afro, curly hair on the main stage in the main uh, commercials internationally on campaigns in um, on billboards in Times Square and all over the world. And I was very, very appreciative of that. It was a long time coming. It was a, a quite the battle because prior to that commercial, I have always worn my hair natural like how it is now, but it wasn't always well received. I remember being uh, looked down upon at casting agencies. I remember my uh, my modeling agent, I'd come in and she'd say, I mean, you're just, you're, you're beautiful, but th there's something about this hair. I mean, this hair, like it was, you know, almost like she was appalled that my hair could be so big and curly. And it was never looked at as valuable until word got out that Pantene was doing a relaxed and natural campaign. And they were looking for women who had natural hair and women who had relaxed hair. So of course, who did they immediately think of for the natural hair, it was me. So it was a joy to book that job. It was a, a good four to five years. I'm very grateful to the brand. And because of that history and because of that commercial, now fast forward to now to 2021 and women are very much happy with how their hair is naturally growing out of their head. You see all kind of advertisement, adverts, commercials with uh, Afro hair, curly hair, short hair, you name it, it's, it's being visible now. And that wasn't the case 10 to 15 years ago. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the Pantene history that I've made. And in doing so, I've always loved hair. I've always loved beauty. So my way of uplifting women and giving back to the community is always through beauty and through hair. Um, as a fashion model, hair has always been a part of my life. It's a part of me anyway. But when I moved here to London with my family, I was always stopped on the street 
ask and people would and women would ask questions about my hair. It would mainly be women who had long, beautiful blonde hair that had daughters that had curly hair that looked like my hair. So they'd stop me and they'd say, listen, my daughter's hair is just like yours. I want it to look like that. I need to give her that confidence. I don't know how to do it. How did you get your hair like that? And after having these conversations in Chelsea on King's Road pretty much every other day during the school runs, I decided to create a crown of curls, which is my very, uh, I, uh, I adore this, um, this uh, I wanna say project, it's more than a project actually, it's very near and dear to my heart because it gives me an opportunity to instill self-love and hair love, which happens to be our motto at A Crown of Curls. And I get to see the joy that it brings when these little girls come in and they're very timid and very shy. And then once their hair is styled or once they can see that their mom knows how to style their hair, they have this, they're oozing confidence and they're walking a little bit taller. Their shoulders are a bit back, their head is up high and they're just looking in the mirror and they're just smiling. And you can just see the joy that they have through hair. So I think that mentoring is very important. I think is that you? Sorry. Okay. I think uh, reaching out to the youth at an early age is very important. And um, what we do at A Crown of Curls is we actually provide hair training courses where we personally come into your home and teach the moms, caregivers, foster parents how to maintain their children's natural, curly, thick, beautiful, curly hair. Not only just maintaining it and knowing how to style it, but also using the correct language. When you go, when you're doing your children's hair and you're using negative terms and negative words, oh, it's too thick, it's too hard, I can't get the comb through, oh, you broke the comb. That in, that's internalized, that, they will internalize that. And before you know it, they're thinking, oh, there's something wrong with my hair. This, they're using bad word, language. So we talk about language, we talk, we talk about the importance of knowing how to detangle with finger detangling, so you're not just taking the comb and, and yanking from the scalp, starting at the bottom, working your way up. Things like uh, that, if you have natural hair or curly hair, you know that when you get your hair braided, you have to tie it down with the scarf. You need a silk, um, um, silk or satin pillowcase. These are all things that we learn and that we will not learn. These are things that we know in the community if you have natural hair. Well, you can't expect a mom who's white from Russia to, to know that. So I have moms calling me, you know, I just took, you know, Rayana to get her hair braided at Carnival. And then she woke up the next morning and the braids were all over the place. What happened? And I'm like, oh, did you tie the hair down? Tie the hair down with what? So, you know, just simple things like that make a world of a difference. And for me, the joy comes when I receive a call from my clients and they're like, oh my goodness, we went to a family function and one of my clients, she's Russian and her husband is Nigerian and she has been yearning to be able to get the daughter's hair so that she can get the blessings of her mother-in-law um, and sisters-in-laws about taking care of the baby's hair and she just wasn't up to up she wasn't able to do it but after taking our courses for some time she re felt really confident about it and she called me just saying how happy she was to walk into the family function and the mother-in-law was like oh so is there a new hair salon in in this in the town and she's like no it was you know home 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 of hair something she made up and she's like home of hair and she's like yes I did it. I styled her hair. And she said the look that her mother-in-law gave her, the hug, she was just so proud and so happy. And she was just, she said those, those were the moments that she had been dreading, but looking forward to because she just, in the beginning, just thought that she could never, never uh, do it. And then she also would call and just say her, she's noticed a difference in her daughter. Her daughter is more confident now. The girls in her class now want to know how they can do curly hair. Oh, can I go to a crown of curls? Can my hair do that? And how come my hair is just straight? It just does this. I want my hair to go out. I want Afro. So now what was looked as negative is now looked at as cool. Oh, wow, your hair can do this. Your hair can do that. It's so versatile. And um, to me, that is what a crown of curls is all about. That's what uplifting women is all about. It starts when they're young because now that child has a sense of, of, of knowing who they are, what their hair can do. Um, they have confidence in themselves and then that carries on to a confident woman when she's in her teens and 20s and that's really what we all want we want our women to be confident we want them to be uh, assured of themselves so that they can go out in the world and be their best authentic selves and that is pretty much uh, what we do and I choose to use hair education and self-love and self-worth as my way of giving back to the community and uplifting women so I just wanted to share that and uh, I'm Princess Keisha and thank you guys for listening. Princess, that was just adorable. And I have to tell you, I saw a story one time about a father that wanted to learn how to take care of his girl's hair. And I thought that was so brilliant. 
But yes, I was one of those kids that had my head shaved because I had, my mom couldn't get a comb through my hair. But anyway, by the way, I'm looking at your hair and I'm just like, wow. I mean, I just, I love it. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, darling. Um, so our next guest, and I'm not sure if she's online. I've been looking for her, but let me introduce her. So it's Rosalie Ortega. She's the former uh, president of Ecuador, and she's also a hair ambassador. So Rosalia, are you here? Give her a minute here. She might be hidden under another name. Rosalia? Okay, well, we'll, um, we'll come back to her a little bit later. Um, I'll in introduce our next guest, which is um, Her Excellency Astrid Martins. She's special, special advisor, economic and social to the Congo. So Astrid, can you unmute? Astrid, are you here? I am. I'm here. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> you? it's fine. Good afternoon to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, um, I want to say a big, huge thank you to Hair Foundation for organizing this conference. And also, especially thank you to Mercy for inviting me to um, this conversation. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce myself. So at least you will um, um, have a little, it, where my journey started. So um, as you introduced me earlier, my name is Astrid Martins. I'm currently a special advisor of the Republic Democratic of Congo. I am a deputy reporter and a member of the Economic and Social Council Bureau here in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. I live, I live in here in DRC now, but I lived in, in the UK for many, many years. Um, I was working within the health sector and my family still lives in the UK um, till now. Um, it's a great to return to Africa, to join the government and to support the development of the of, of DRC. I just briefly um, 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 pronounced that. Um, Congo is my home country. Um, I will say to everyone, to every woman, happy International Women Day to all women across the world and especially to the women listening today and to my fellow women on the panel. I think there's no doubt that women are still absent from many positions of the leadership across the world. Um, they are not absent because they don't have the talent or because they don't have the desire to be a leader. They are absent because our system and structure are put that are put barrier in front of them. It is incredibly difficult for women to enter into a position of senior leadership, whether in politics or in businesses. But the evidence abundant what the women lead. It make it, it, it make a great contribution to organization to the nation. It is up to today even being taught for phenomenal women. Yes, indeed, we are phenomenal women in leadership during the COVID-19. When you look at across the world, you can see great women leading their nation to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. As example, Mrs. Angela Merkel, the German ch chancellor, who for many is arguably the most important leader today in the world. And 
we also have another lady, another special lady, Mrs. Jacinda Arden, Prime Minister of New Zealand. She also did a great work for our country. Even our first lady, Mrs. Denise Nyakerichi Sekedi for the DLC has done a great deal of work mobilizing women, mobilizing communities in, in the effort to ensure that the damage caused by the pandemic is mitigated. And our country can recover quickly. Let me also use this opportunity to celebrate and to congratulate Mrs. Ngozi Okojo Iwell. I don't know if I pronounced well her name, for becoming the first female director general of the World Trade Organization. In my personal journey, I have had to struggle to complete my education and juggle, juggling the tasks of a motherhood, raising my five children and now grandchildren. As I said earlier, I started my career in England within the health sector. Then having to move countries and come to work in Congo, I'm delighted that the president of Democratic of Congo um, Felix Chilombo Chisekedi so fit to give me this opportunity. My personal lesson is that it takes strong will commitment, confidence, resilience. This is what empower me to stay strong throughout. In closing, I would like to say that nation building stronger commitment to gender equality, a stronger nation. And I hope that everyone listening today, including the men, they will reaffirm their commitment to removing barrier and building in more equal society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Really appreciate you being here today and thank you for your words. I'm now going to introduce, um, and before I do that, I'm uh, just gonna let you know that Mercy will be taking over for um, hosting the, re the remainder of the event. But before I go, mm -hmm. I wanna introduce um, uh, Rosalia Ortega. She is the former president of Ecuador and she's also a HERA ambassador. So uh, Rosalia, if you can open your yes. mic. Perfect. Yes, I am here, yeah. Great. All yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning for me in Ecuador. I'm in South America. And uh, good evening, I think, for all of you in UK and other parts of the, of the world. I think Mary is in US, then we are in the morning also. Yes, we are. Well, uh, I am, I'm really happy to be part of this event that has the name of the phenomenal women's. Yeah, I think we are phenomenal women's. And we all are responsible of... Uh, in different parts of the world of uh, initiatives uh, and also about uh, uh, trying to empower women in, in many fields, in fields of politi politics. I was in politics for some years and I, I, I had, uh, I'm very proud to have been the first minister of education in my country and also the first vice president and the first president of my country and the first in many initiatives like in Brazil, working with the environmental issues because we cannot let behind the concerns about climate change and others. And um, also um, uh, in, in some other uh, initiatives of, of civil society like in education and in other fields. Uh, now I had been invited and I say thank you to Mercy and also to Mary uh, to be part of this uh, incredible meeting and uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what is the, the meaning of uh, an initiative that was created by 
an, an amazing woman, uh, Marinela Mirpuri in, um, in Portugal, when she talked to me about ERA initiative, ERA in, in, initiative, I was thinking that she was a little crazy, of course, because uh, build a city for women sounds like crazy, but it is not because when we know what has been the role of women uh, uh, around uh, the, the whole history of humanity, we feel that we, the women, we were the builders of civilizations. When I saw what happens in my own country and I know the roots of uh, how we started with a matriarchal um, tribe that was, they were good builders, good uh, people dedicated to commerce, uh, good people to domesticate some uh, uh, biological species like uh, corn. You know that corn is from Latin America. The corn was domesticated by woman and we did a lot of things why we cannot create an initiative like Hira that has uh, to be a lot with uh, um, the building of uh, cities of women cities for women it doesn't mean that we are not um, that we are excluding men it's not because uh, we know that we have to be inclusive but uh, the cities has to be very friendly for women how we can develop it, how we can build uh, concepts uh, that uh, are very friendly for women. Um, I was uh, reading a little bit about some initiative that women in Africa, concretely in Kenya, develop an, a town for women because they didn't feel safe in the past in their own homes with all what's happening with the violence inside the homes with uh, the, um, uh, um, some barriers that were built against women to participate in political affairs, in social affairs, only asking for the permission of men. And uh, we feel that in this uh, century, uh, 21 century, and also after COVID, uh, so, uh, after pandemic society, we must, we yeah, must uh, be very creative to generate spaces where all women and men feel comfortable, feel that our needs can be uh, uh, fed with all these kind of initiatives. Then I am happy to be a kind of HERA ambassador in Latin America and maybe in other parts of the world. Uh, we visited with the uh, uh, Marianela, some land, some place in Panama because of the um, crucial uh, si uh, geographical situation of Panama. You know that the Panama Channel uh, communicates both oceans, Atlantic and, and Pacific. Then it's a very important, a key uh, place. And, and I think it is uh, uh, working uh, the conversations bet between the government of Panama and ERA uh, initiative to build uh, a city there. Uh, well, I am um, uh, going, uh, uh, including further more uh, in, in advance, I strongly believe that we have to pay a lot of attention about what's happening with women in our times. Uh, uh, we know, and I, and I hear part of the intervention of the previous uh, uh, panelists talking about how women leaders in some different countries in the best way, like in, our, in uh, Germany with Angela Merkel or with Jacinta Arden in, in New Zealand or with President Tsai in, in Taiwan that is so close to China that we could imagine that uh, um, Taiwan could suffer a lot more, but uh, the leader of a woman has uh, really uh, make the difference. Then. Uh, we feel that, of course, we are aware of that, but at the same time, we are thinking and we are learning that in, in many countries in the world, women is losing power. How is losing power? Because we are losing jobs. I saw the statistics in the United States and also in many countries in Europe uh, about uh, what's happening with jobs for women when um, the society suffer an economical crisis, like we are suffering in many countries, um, companies are uh, deciding to cut jobs 
and guess why what the women jobs are cutting are, 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 are had been cutting the first and we are feeling that we are going back going back in terms of jobs but also in terms of education in i i i am uh, um, studying what's happening in Latin America, for example, with the schools. We still have most of our schools closed and, and, and uh, people is trying to, to do it, it online or distant learning, but it, it doesn't work uh, many times because uh, in, in uh, um, places that they don't have connectivity, especially in rural areas or in the surrounders of the big cities, the connectivity is really bad or poor. And also they don't have the devices, they don't have a smartphone, they don't have, they have probably a small cell phone to, to make calls, one per family. If you have five kids and you have a mom and a father that try that are trying to do uh, like uh, um, work uh, from distance, how they can be connected. And uh, we have a statistics that uh, a lot of girls are out of school, especially girls, because they are helping the small kids, because they are helping the moms, and they are also working on the streets, because the economy situation is really, really hard. Then we have to, to pay attention to what's happening in our world, post-pandemic post world, post-COVID world. I say that in the past, we used to, to say, that before Christ and after Christ, now we have to talk about before COVID and after COVID. Yeah, that's the reality. That's what, what we are living now. And after COVID, we have this situation uh, of increasing the level of uh, um, desertion of, of students. They are leaving schools and also the women are leaving works sometimes because the the companies uh, cut the places of, of work and other times because women decided to stay, stay at home to control and to take care of the small kids that have to be connected and have to do work uh, at home uh, because the schools uh, are still uh, closed. Uh, that's the situation that I want to call the attention and uh, maybe we empowered women and men that are helping us and they are very open minds because I see here that there are some men, um, they are open mind of what to do, why it is happening, how we can uh, make it uh, uh, less uh, uh, or, or, or have a less damage in, in these circumstances that we are living. And in this field, I think HERA initiative is a good opportunity and maybe it can spread, be spread in other countries. I, I know that uh, Marianela is doing a good work in Morocco and in France, and we are doing some kind of work also here in Latin America, in Panama. And I know that there are some initiatives in Brazil, but it will be good that with the partnership of many people of UK, it can grow also in the UK and also in other um, countries in Europe and in other parts of the world. Thank you very much for the attention and good luck with this initiative. Thank you, Mercy, and, and thank you all the people to invite me. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was um, a very powerful word and thank you for honoring the invitation. Um, next, we have um, Ewon Jin. I hope I said her name um, well. She's this uh, chairwoman of Chic Me, but she, amongst her other accolades, she likes to be very humble. She's also a very good friend of mine. Um, she um, did the painting, I believe, for the Queen's 60th birthday and also for some former Prime Minister, um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown and um, Tony Blair and other notable people. She's also um, does a lot of, she's a lady of many um, hats. So she fits the bill of our phenomenal women. Um, so over to you, Ewan. Oh, thank you very much for, for this. That's a, a, such a, a, a introduction. Well, thank you, first of all, for Haran and for Mercy for inviting me to for this conference with incredible panel and guests. Um, I think it's probably just I have a little brief understanding of my background since I really 
I'm the first generation of Chinese women who was privileged to freely study abroad after China opened the door. And that's lead to, for me to almost fuel up a little cultural void between the, the West and China. And I uh, always, as uh, Mercy mentioned, I was very privileged uh, before I graduated from university, the queen um, was collecting my work because it was a um, particular talk about the UK Asian community. Um, and also commissioned uh, for art projects when Boris Johnson uh, visited China for the first time as the London mayor. Um, so ever since that, my, my work is a bit entangled with the, the press, um, with the art and culture. Um, particular, I'm very interested to hear the, all the initiatives, particularly for Hera City, because I also sit on the panel for lots of the Chinese uh, cities looking to expand and build the culture. Um, development, because this is what China really lack of. And uh, one of this includes uh, President Xi's um, flagship city called Xiamen. So it's uh, right on the south, um, close to the entire Pacific Asia. Uh, that's his vision of building that city into the next culture center. Um, so that was a huge uh, background. There are so many things and working with the, both the BBC and the Chinese central television. You can imagine that's a sensitive uh, <laughs> trading between the lines. Um, in this, also because my history back into the whole art and creative field, um, I started this uh, Chic Me as a company. And uh, because this, we find that actually there's a huge inequality in the fashion industry. The, the, actually, there's 85% of fashion students are female, yet only 43% of brands presenting on the fashion weeks are run by women. And even worse, only 14% of the major fashion labels have female CEOs. Well, this data illustrates such a drastic triangle with a strong intake of women into fashion, but few reaching the top. So that's why we were inspired to build up Shikmi. And this is an um, in incredible journey because we find a lot, especially in COVID, a lot of the brands have suffered trem tremendously because right before they were having new pieces releasing for the new show that they find themselves has nowhere to sell. Many has a financial vital in-person events that's all canceled. And what Shikmi has built even in, the, in uh, the COVID and before COVID is a way list all fashion events, large or small, free of charge. And this fairness helped shake me to become one of, the, no, actually the biggest in-person fashion event site in the UK and the US, loved by indie brands and consumers. And on our platform, 70% of the events were run by women. We particularly see the big giant e-commerce site boomed and flourished because of COVID lockdown. But the many indie brands has nowhere to turn because those gatekeepers were not giving them the opportunity. So what we have done is quickly understand their suffering, shifting from a marketing company into e-commerce and in 12 months that we never sold a thing and we sold over $6 million of stocks for all of these indie brands led by women. And this is something we are very, very proud of. We think as we expand, Shikmi is because my background linked both the UK, US, Europe, and China in the decision level down to brand level that we able to reflect how we better serving the millions of creative women in the world. So what we think is really important is to build up, to break and shake and destroy the current unfair fashion system. That's very hard for women to get in and install a new inclusive fashion landscape where designer of all genders, all races and all classes can flourish. Loved by consumers because of their talents not because of their history and background. So I think uh, 
because everyone is just so wonderful. So I don't want it to take up so much time on this. Um, I hope that's gave a little bit of insight of why we're doing this. <laughs> Mercy. You're muted, Mercy. I'm muted, I'm muted. <laughs> oh! <laughs> famous words of Zoom. Um, yes, thank you for that, um, everyone. Yes. Um, that was fantastic and you're yeah, always as usual very very humble um, and next to an amazing woman and i can't see she, she can tell she's the next person i'm introducing um dr bartlett all the way in the bahamas a wonderful woman and she is just well she can speak for herself and thank you for honoring this well, welcome. Um, I have to say, I am so honored and privileged to be a part of this global conversation. I want to say hello to all of you from paradise in the Bahamas. And I feel that I have an awesome opportunity to represent the Bahamas, which is, has the third strongest economy in the Western Hemisphere and the Caribbean, which is the most stable region. Um, in the Western Hemisphere. And so I was particularly pleased that um, we are represented after seeing the diversity. And I think uh, that is a part of our success in moving forward, that we are able to um, talk to one another, know each other's culture. And uh, I've been asked to speak just a little bit about the economic emancipation movement and how are we going to succeed in this COVID environment? And, and, and one of the things I've learned is that great leaders really live in three tenses, the past, the present, and the future. I want to commend Mercy. Uh, she was exceptional on a television interview that I had the privilege for her to participate in recently. And um, I believe that media is that medium to bring us together, to bring similar vision and values together. When we're talking about women, uh, I want to observe first that women were born at the table of equality. The coronavirus pandemic is providing an invaluable opportunity to restore the original plan for mankind, male and female, black, white, Asian, and Jews. Can I just pause there for a moment to say that when I went to Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, I did not see color because that's how I was brought up. I was brought up with, with my father's mother being white and living in our home and my other grandmother's home. And we were taught that we do not choose our friends based on what the color of a person is, but the character. We choose our friends based on where they want to go in life, the vision. And so we were all born to lead. That's what I was taught. And according to the success manual for life, the Bible, the purpose of male and female is to dominate industry, dominion produces excellence, and sharpens leadership skills. When Eve, going back in history for you, was not satisfied with 99% of ownership in the Garden of Eden, she persuaded her husband, Adam, to succumb to greed and covetousness. Their decision began the process of undermining the leadership position of women at the board and cabinet tables. And so the journey to restoration will be accelerated when we commit to submitting to his vision for Earth and mankind Scientists have discovered the oldest human remains in Botswana. But, and, and, you know, it's believed that that is the home of the Garden of Eden. It was paradise, that timeless harmony. That's where I'm from, in the Bahamas. Paradise, that timeless harmony. We were born to live in environments governed by peace and prosperity. And of course, some of the European um, countries uh, and, and, and Taiwan and Asian countries have experienced this peace and prosperity governing their environments. And when we look at it, when Adam and Eve were exiled from the Garden of Eden, 
They co-founded the garment manufacturing business. In other words, they created an industry out of their crisis. And that's what we are talking about now. In Rwanda, the most notable conflict was the 1994 genocide. What most of us don't know is the genocide in Rwanda paved the way for gender equality. Rwanda's legislature is majority female. Women make up 62% of Rwanda's national legislature. legislature. Their economy is growing. The wisdom, power, and strength in effective female leadership is being demonstrated during this pandemic. Countries led by women and systematically and significantly better COVID-19 outcomes. The relatively early outcomes from Germany, we, we talked about this early, early and I'm so um, I'm pleased to be on the panel with royals and uh, with, with, with diplomats. But we talked about earlier about Germany, New Zealand, Denmark, Taiwan, and Finland attracted many, many headlines, even ahead of the Bahamas in the Caribbean. We are so proud of you leaders. I'm so proud that we have the uh, former president of uh, Ecuador here as well. Let us use their successes as an impetus to accelerate our journey to equality. There's research that forecasts that gender parity in ministerial positions will not be achieved before 2077. No, 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 that's unacceptable. Let us defy that. By doing what? Intentionally destroying the barriers of race and nationality. I would like to see the femme foundry here. I want to wear your perfume. I want to see the femme foundry app here. I would be so honored. Let us include the Caribbean, the Bahamas in your discussion. Number two, commit to an overarching vision of economic emancipation. We have such deep levels of poverty. How do we do that? Let's deem August a month once a year and declare that it's economic emancipation month. Without vision, the people throw off restraint. And so we have allowed our governments and so many uh, instances in so many nations to lead us by project. Projects have dead ends. But if we know that we are born to live in environments of peace and prosperity, we are going to evaluate every day the policies that we must implement to represent the human potential and empower the human potential. All we have to do is apply our work, our work ethic, and develop our skill to execute. And finally, number three, let's work together as we are on this global uh, conversation and on this powerful platform. If we also determine that we will become landlords in this fast emerging digital economy. And earlier, we talked about the functional illiteracy and the challenges that we have in education. Well, it seemed to me that that's an opportunity for us to band together and, uh, and, and, and implement some sort of social entrepreneurship because our children in the Bahamas, in the Caribbean, in Africa, you know what? COVID-19 has, has neutralized a lot of things. And um, a lot of us have to start in the ground floor, Italy, and some of the European countries, even the United Kingdom, you have a lot of challenges. We have to start from ground zero. And so a lot of our children are having to adjust because they don't have the pen and paper of the 21st century. But what can we do to get together? White, black, it don't matter. Asian, it's the human potential that we are after. And we, as women, can lead the way. We are born to be at the table of opportunity and leadership. So together, we can change the trajectory of women. The highest position of executive power has been held by a woman in just 58 countries since 1960. We're gonna do better than that because of platforms like this. We need political and economic liberation. When we unite under the vision of economic emancipation, I humbly submit for your consideration 
that we recreate environments of love. And let me just say with economic emancipation, we are very pleased that universities in Ghana, considerations in Nigeria, uh, well, not considerations, as a matter of fact, one of the, uh, I've met with royals in Nigeria who have, who have committed to um, the economic emancipation movement and working with some very exciting programs. I believe that, you know, it's going to be a glorious day. I love the Queen, the Queen of England. And I think that we have benefited and, and, the, and that culture has really um, helped us have culture in this region of the Caribbean. But the foundation of civilization is the African continent. And I can't wait to see that restoration and that glory um, that is well known for the royals in Africa. And so we have that honor one for another. And I'm also pleased that universities in the United States are on board with the economic emancipation. I don't have the time to talk about all of the exciting things that we are doing, but what it is, there's nothing we can't do when we unite under the same vision and share similar values and believe in that philosophy that we can help each other succeed. And so, as I was saying, that if we commit to this vision that started in the beginning of time, where we were born in an environment of peace and prosperity, that that environment is, gives us the template for the power of equality, love, peace, and prosperity. Let's do it again around the world. And I would say in the power of ownership, in the spirit of helping each other succeed, destination should always be the economic emancipation, destination, the promised land. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I can't wait to hear the rest of you speaking. And I can tell you that I've been enriched by all of the panelists that have contributed so far. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Just as usual, you're a dynamite and um, we are certainly empowered and feel honored to have had your presence here. Um, we now go straight to Nigeria to Her Excellency, um, the First Lady Fola Banjo. Could you unmute yourself, Your Excellency? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. We can hear you. Uh, we can't see you, though. Okay. Time to add this money. Come on. Hello, can you see me now? No. You've muted yourself. No. Hello. Can you see me now? No, if you can just um, continue to talk whilst you try to switch your camera on. Okay. Oh, Thank you. good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Paula Banjo. Hello? Yeah, can yes, we can now? see you then. <laughs> yeah. We can see and hear you, my dear. Carry on, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mrs. Banjo Paula. I'm the chairperson of the North Coast for Government. She's a woman. Um, I'm in the NGO and have um, my foundation. I use it to promote the young ladies, women, and widows. Because I believe women are the nation. Women are the world. Without women, there's nothing impossible. Women, we, we, if, we, if we can look at the way to empower a woman, I believe so much can happen in a society. Um, during the COVID period, I experienced so much. I had opportunity of meeting with so many women, talking to them. So I was able to understand their pain as women. Uh, 
um, I just realized our women have so much upset, but um, we are not given the privilege to make do of it. By not being empowered probably by our nation or by the society or by our husband. Our women are being caught short. We are not given so much power to do the necessary things in the society. Of which I believe if our women are given the opportunity, we can even do better than men. I'm sorry to say, but as a truth. Um, meeting with um, some, well, from, um, one or two women during the COVID period, I, women that have been idle, that have nothing to do, that have been all by themselves, probably being just being fed by the other. But due to this, uh, the problem in the world that they could not go out to do things, the men, their husband could not go out to do things. And they have to like, rely on the women. Um, so that we got to know our women as so much to do. By themselves, they came up with so many things. I was, I, I, I realized that our women are even stronger than men. During the COVID period, um, I had my own um, NGO, so I tried to encourage people. I went to our office, the office meeting one people one on one, trying to see how I can be of help to them. And it got to a point that I, even me myself, I was helpless, you know, because I just I was thinking nobody knew when that was going to stop. I was thinking, okay, for how long will I be doing this? Will I have to get people's doorstep, giving food, giving drinks, giving you no know, one thing or the other? So like I tried to encourage them, okay, that okay, what can you do in the society by yourself to empower your home, to take care of your children, to take care of your children, uh, husband? And um, I was surprised that you know, willingly, that some of them are like they could go in, they, they could go into farming, they could go into fishing, they could go into making of bags, making of clothes, making of nose masks, even sanitizers, you know. I was I was impressed. I was impressed about a woman, as a woman. Okay, so I got to realize if our women are being empowered, that means we have so much to offer. But due to the um, the less privilege we have been given in the society, due to the fact that we are not being given enough privilege to prove ourselves, you know, so it's really like we're using what they could really fall out of the, to, 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 to the society. Yeah, like um, one of the things, one of the things I, I encourage my women or the women were able to do, to, I was surprised the women could produce bags with Ankara. We, we Africans believe in our, Ankara, our fabric, but there, yes, there's no, um, there's, no, there's no empowerment for us to do, to do it. There's no empowerment for our women to do it. I was surprised the woman came up with this. This is made with Ankara. This is a bag. A very durable one. You know? The woman came up with this, told me she could make this, and we made it as much as possible. And to my surprise, she was able to sell and make good, good sales out of it. And up to this, that is what she does for living. Even this, this is a nose mask made by Adore. Yeah, this is a nose mask made, made by Adore. A woman, one of our women made this. And up to this, this, this is what she does for living. And she's using it to take care of the family. Well, what I would just have to say is, um, we just, this is a jacket made with Ankara that can be wear to anywhere and you know, one will be accepted. So what I'm trying to say in the North is uh, there are so many ways we could empower a woman in her own way. Although I got to understand our society is quite different. Our, our Nigeria is different from um, Ghana. Ghana is different from Canada, Canada is different from US, you know. We have different ways we could empower our own women. But in our own way in Nigeria, I believe this is way this is one of the ways we could empower our women, especially not on, on agriculture. Agriculture is the one way is the, is the one way we could really empower our women. 
so by so so saying, because the North trust, I believe there are so many things that a woman could do. If you are given the opportunity to, a woman are we, we are the, we are the world. Women are the world. So if we are actually given that opportunity to talk, I think we could turn things around. We could we could turn the world around and make it a better place, even for our men to live. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I I was in a meeting. I just have to be able to bring this um, program. I I thought it's going to represent me, but because um I just I have so much so much respect for the organizer of this program. I said no, I just have to be here to say one or two things. So I think it's a, pre it's a great privilege for me to be given the opportunity to talk on this program. Mm -hmm. so once again, I am Mrs. Fola Banjo. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, yes, um, when I gave the topic to each of the women speakers, they approached me that the actual theme I gave them can have different interpretations for different women. We all interpret yes. different, the same thing in different ways. Mm -hmm. And exactly. with our culture, which is what brings us together, is the one thing is that we are women. Exactly. It is good that we are, as women, are able to gather together to share experiences, to uplift each other. And mm -hmm. this is the purpose of our platform. We do not exclude men. We have men mm -hmm. involved in our organizations. We believe okay, in a fine. nuclear family. We believe in honoring our men, but we also oh, recognize yes, that definitely. men, that women, are the ones who give birth to, to life. To the men. And a lot of <laughs> times it's women who make a home what it is. Mm. And this is why we try to, if a woman is happy, the rest of the home is happy, the children are happy. Definitely, definitely. So it is important for us to gather as women and to try to put ideas together, to try mm. to, make our world a better place, try to uplift mm. each other and straighten each other's crowns and not to tear mm. each other down. Yeah. We might all have different organizations, mm. especially here on this platform, but mm. it does not stop us from connecting and collaborating with each other and supporting yeah. another sister as did most of my speakers. Mm. I would like to also give an unexpected speaker the opportunity to speak, a close friend of mine who is based in Bromley and she plays a role which in a women's world, it, sorry, in a men's world, there is very few of people in her position. I give the platform to Reverend Agnita Oiwali who is the um, chaplain of Bromley. Could you unmute yourself, Reverend Agnita? Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you now. Right, you should be able to see me any second. <laughs> well, Shalom, uh, it's lovely to be given this opportunity. Um, as you've heard, my name's Agnita, and it's a privilege to be able to join you and just, just share something with you. So for me, as a woman, growing up um, in the in the late 1950s, um, I've discovered that the thing that gives us opportunity is education. And um, for me, I was very privileged to go um, to King's College London 
and read for a degree in theology. And I discovered through that, that um, it opened up so much to me. And so I've gone on, I've been a chair of governors, uh, sat on uh, different boards, um, particularly with disability. And one of the things that I found is that education opens up the way for women. My daughter um, had an opportunity to go to a, a, a lovely school and got a scholarship. And then she's now studying English at Cambridge University. So I think it's important that we make sure that women, girls are educated as far as possible. And we need to encourage people to do that throughout society. It is the way forward for them. And so many women in our communities are um, not put first in education in, in different communities where there's a lack of funds, women are often the ones that are deprived and that has to change. And anything we can do to help that will help women take their right places. I've been in situations where I've been the only woman in a room and um, it, I've been placed there by God, I believe, but also because of what I bring to the table from the education that I've received and from my ability to be able to communicate effectively. And in some situations, I'm in those positions because I'm a safe black woman. Um, I have a mixed heritage, my mother, white and Jewish, and my father from the West Indies. And then I went, to ma I went on and married a Nigerian. Uh, so that's been my sort of experience. But I take those opportunities, whether I'm the token black woman, um, I take them because then I have a voice and I can see things change. And I've noticed that when I was at university, there weren't many people of colour at King's College London. And that has, that's now changed, but I see that I had the opportunity, if you like, to be one of those people that, that set the way for others. I'm also a qualified teacher, so I have been into different schools. And when I'm there, and particularly when I see girls who, who don't think they can do things, I always seek to encourage them to see who they are, what they have, what they can bring, and that they don't write themselves off because they've had a difficult background. I encourage them to work hard with their education so they can move ahead. And I know that many of you have done that. You see that that has been a pathway for yourselves. But even now, my daughter, although she's at Cambridge, she still realizes that there is such a lot of inequality um, for particularly black young women. The numbers are slowly creeping up but they are still a minority. And we have to make sure that young women of color and young women full stop are able to see themselves in the high places. I was so, so encouraged by uh, what Dr. Bartlett said uh, to see that in, you know, women in power in government, that's unusual, but we should see it more and more. We have to encourage them. You know, this thing about with the hair, natural hair and how important it is, we need to give these young women the ability to see that who they are is beautiful. They don't have to straighten their hair to fit in. They don't have to dress a certain way. I love these African fabrics where people have opportunities to break out of their poverty because more and more they're becoming desired with the whole black lives thing um black lives matter um that went on i think people were desperate to be able to identify with black people they were desperate to be able to 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 just understand and some of these things that are part of our identity these beautiful bright colours that we love to wear. These things women can get involved in all over and bring these things out more because they're still not where they should be. And people are a little afraid and we just need to help them see that, that what we have is beautiful and that they should really um, inspire others 
to, to join us. And I would just like to, I, I don't want to carry on too much, but I would like to say, um, for me, the church has been one of the greatest opportunities for women to achieve and move forward. It's changed over the years, but you see more and more women taking up the roles in the church in the right way without anger for what has gone on before, but actually beginning to take their place. And I believe the church is still a very influential place where um, things can change, where we can see people move on and God wants to bring out people's identities. He loves how he created you, obviously, because that was part of him. <laughs> it's his idea that you look the way you do. And I firmly believe that God wants people, um, all people, to be in their right place. We are called women. God took woman from Abraham's side. Why? So we should share, not to be dominated, but to be able to rise up to our place. And I'm so encouraged and uh, by what I've heard today, and I hope we will really continue. Um, and that would be fantastic. So God bless you all. Thank you so much for what you've shared. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Agnita. Um, I know I put you there on this spot, but um, <laughs> I know that um, you, you've just been an inspiration as a woman to my life. And I am where I am um, a lot because of a lot of things you've imparted into me, especially your charisma and having somebody there who is in a women in a men's world and still able to to um, be very feminine, but still take charge of a room. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about myself. Sorry, uh, Mercy. Yes. Mercy, can I just say something? I want to say something because you are a phenomenal woman. I've known you for many years. The way you've raised your family, brought up your children and got them into great schools where their future is assured. You have been an excellent example to so many people. And I'm so glad you brought this conference together. But you are an amazing woman. And I believe that some of your advice, uh, your strategic decisions, are things that need to be shouted about. So God bless you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very humbled. Um, so as I was saying, for those who don't know my position, I'm currently a chairwoman of the Conservative Party. I sit on the number one seat here in the UK. And I got into that position not by choice. I was voted in and put into the deep end. My background is in media. I've got five children. I originally was doing juggling home life and trying to, as many women do, do something which you can do around having children, which was to set up a business working from home, which became very successful. And I found from there a lot of people, not just women, started coming to me to ask me, how do you do that? And I found myself mentoring people and that then because of the area I lived in, there was not too many people of my color. So they, they wanted to um, form groups. So I started an Afro-Caribbean group in my uh, area promoting black businesses and doing African market, which was very successful. And that's where my link with my council started. Um, I have, as Agnita said, I've got children who are on scholarships in top schools here in the UK, not just in the UK, which their schools deemed globally to be amongst the top schools that would be Eton and Westminster Abbey, Cheatham School of Music, the, the best uh, music school in the world. Um, for me, education, as a lot of the women who have spoken here have said, education is very, very important. Without education, there, 
we, 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 we suffer. So for me, it was very important to give my children the best starting life because I felt that if I could give them the best starting life, which included giving them music lessons so that they would have something to fall back on, that if there was no jobs, if we ever came to a time where there's no jobs, they'll be able to teach music or, or perform, um, that, that I would equip my children as we do as women, because I, I, I gather that a lot of times as women, we worry about our children and, and their future. And that is why we work and we do what we do is for the future generations. I, I strongly believe in building legacies so my children did manage to get into good schools and my eldest son has um, released an album. He got signed to one of the second world largest um, record label, Warner Brothers. But my journey continued a couple of years ago where I decided, because I believe a, a lot of people said, who are, there's a lot of elite women here. Um, I don't think I fit in. I think most of the women on this platform who have got to where they are in life um, positions, which are deemed high by society, they went through a journey, a journey that started from somewhere where most people would not want to start with nothing. So for me, my journey did start from a humble beginning and I did go back to university to do my master's about four years ago. And at the same time, I went to do an internship in parliament because I've always in wanted to, to get into politics to make a change in the world. And through that journey, that's when I started getting people asking me to come and speak. I learned a lot. I started discovering who I was. I started discovering that through some of the people on this platform who gave me positions, that there is more, that I can achieve more and that I'm not just a mother. I'm, 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 I'm not just a wife, that there is more to me that I can give more of myself. And I began to, to start with the little knowledge that I had empowering women from my journeys and my mistakes and not just women the youth as well and it is through that I'm now sitting on my seat and I, I feel honoured um, that I've been recognised by um, certain people to be amongst the top 100 influential women in the world but it did not happen suddenly it takes a journey to get to that position where you now empowering people and it's through mistakes and it's through um, challenges. I believe every woman who's spoken on this platform has faced major challenges that they've had to overcome. And it was through those challenges that they've been able to, like the president, to run countries, to be special advisors, and Her Excellency to be a woman who is a woman who's, who empowers other women and is a woman in her city who helps other women. So I do hope in closing that a lot of women here who are whatever level that they're encouraged that you can start your journey now to empower other people, to uplift yourself. It's never too late to go back to study. It's never too late to touch your community. There's always something great in you as a woman. Every woman is phenomenal. And for the men who are here, I'd like to encourage you to be like some of the men who I see here who've encouraged me to uplift the women in your lives, women who you know, and to just say, well done, you're doing a good job. Not to be um, what I hear some men say that there's too many women's conferences, there's too much of women empowerment, because as I sit here today in the UK, as a female politician, 
there is only, I believe, two female MPs in London, which is absolutely shocking. And for people to say that there's no need for platforms like this to encourage other women to take up positions, I disagree. So thank you all for coming and thank you for listening. I hope you are empowered. Thank you. If there's any questions from anyone in the audience to anybody on the platform, Hello, Mercy. Yes. Hi. I think uh, I'm terrible at uh, telling people about what I've done, but I'm so inspired by everybody. And uh, of course, now I have uh, quite a few fingers in different pies. I saw there was, um, of course, the first lady showing off the beautiful garments. Clearly, that can come to my platform. Perfume-wise, clearly can come to my platform. And of course, when we talk about building female city, can I just say the city I was born created the only Chinese female emperor in the entire over 5,000 years of history. We had a such a heritage. And so I am also, because sitting on the advisory on so many cities, be delighted to see whether there's any partnership with Hara or with any other community who can help. And I truly agree with you because even we build this platform that is charging nobody to list, unlike any president before, like uh, like platforms out there for fashion. We are, like you said, very inclusive. So it, it, it is welcome for any culture, male, female classes. I mean, Britain, there's a huge boundary. And I agree with your friends, uh, the reverend. Um, there's a huge thing about education. So. We also have our social platform. Is there any channels that we can promote anything um, to our own uh, audience and our own um, uh, like community? We're more than happy to. So thank you very much. Thank you. Has anybody else got a, a word to say as we about to close? Um, for me, I would say that uh, Mercy and uh, all the organizers, Hela um, Foundation, um, I would say that all the speakers, um, I would say Madame Jean, Dr. Deborah, Her Excellency, the First Lady Nigeria, uh, I will not mention all the names, but thank you so much for organizing such a great event. And I believe I would only say one word that um, we all men know that we came from women, and my word is to say that we are stronger together. Thank you so much for organizing this event, and what a great inspirational uh, work you have done, you ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And Daniel is part of um, my, my team that I'm going to be doing a, a festival here in the UK, um, providing lockdown <laughs> goes down. Um, we intend to do a, a music festival here, which will be global to bring together different communities and to also showcase women from different cultures all over the world to be singing on one platform. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And please, anyone who has got beautiful young women artists who can advocate, please feel free to send their CVs to Madame Massey and we can organize an online women event for Hela Women Festival. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to have Neil, who's also one of our musicians, who is part of Hera, 
and he's the one leading the Hera Festival Global to have a, a word or two. So, uh, first, I apologize because I lost the, the time I'm here in Germany. Uh, I, received, I received the other time. I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. John called me. Neil, where are you? <laughs> I lost the time here. So, um, thank you very much. Merci. It's beautiful history. Beautiful journal. You're a very fantastic woman. Um, I know about uh, many things about you. Thank you very much for your presence, and your contribution for this amazing project. So, uh, just one few words. My my position for this this project. Uh, I just one singer, composer, and writer. Uh, I compose a uh, one hundred song talk about the woman. <laughs> I'm so. Uh, this, it's amazing work for me because um, thank you very much the women of the world. I feel the other part of me. I feel woman too because <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, the woman uh, showed me beautiful way for grow up with with uh, like men and my journal too, of course. I have so many, uh, have, of course, to be honest, I have one time in my life, I'm so shame for talk about the, uh, the music about the women, because in Brazil, my country, um, the people are so hard about this, this situation and part of my society, unfortunately. So mad, but uh, my music get me uh many power talk about this so uh i hope in the next time we everybody can look in my music talk about this woman this moment exactly this moment we prepare one beautiful song with one amazing singer yanella brooks we prepare it together one beautiful song talk one song talk against the violence of women. I hope you, you everybody like this song. And I think in the next three, two, two weeks, we have this beautiful song for show to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And Neil was very, very humble. He's a Grammy Award winning musician. Um, he's won the Grammy, the Latin Grammy Award um, this year. So he's, like most of our, our speakers, he's very, very humble. And it is something we all need to learn to, to do as we climb up the ladder to ensure we remain humble and we remain simple. And it is with that I'd like to close this meeting. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with anyone, you can connect with me and I can um, connect you with the necessary person who you'd like to collaborate with. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We've asked you all to unmute so you could say goodbye because we've got the whole <laughs> screen there. So yes. we'll wave. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. God bless you all. Bye. bye. God bless you. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome, Mercy. Well done. Well done to Mary. Well done to Marianella. Well done. Pleasure to meet you, Neil, and everybody else that was on the call. Fantastic. Well done, Mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, we may have a little bit of 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 a little b